how about that Chris Rock, Will Smith thing? And I'm like, man, you know, I get that this dude's been doing this for 20 years. I, you know, I get that he does two to four dicks a day. You know, I, I get it. But man, you know, I'd really appreciate some fucking focus here, you know? Hello, and welcome to episode 358 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I am one of the co-founders here at ETR, and we are coming off of a my balls are fucking killing me kind of week. Yes, that's right. On Monday, I did it. I summoned the strength, the courage, the manhood, the testicular fortitude to go through with what I think I think was the right play. Yes, that's right. I submitted to a vasectomy. You know, uh, uh, of course, you know, as with seemingly everything in my life, the whole thing, the whole procedure was just so absurd. So I get there. Obviously, I'm, I'm super nervous. The doc comes into the room. He starts like sketching out for me exactly what he's going to do. Like literally like drawing a picture of my dick. He's like, so here I'm going to cut a hole and then I'm going to go in and I'm going to clip this and I'm going to cut that. I'm going to remove it. I'm just like, you know, bro, please, I can't. I, you know, I, I can't face hearing this right now. You know, I don't need to hear exactly. I don't need to know exactly what's about to happen to my fucking cock, you know? So anyway, I, 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 we get through that part of it, the sketch part. And I was actually curious, you know, what kind of position I was going to be in for this vasectomy. And it turns out it's pretty simple. I laid on my back, you know, legs straight out, and they kind of flip your dick up towards your belly button, you know, leaving just the balls exposed. And then they put a sheet with a hole in it that covers everything except those balls. You know, I think that's how the Orthodox have the sex, by the way. But anyway, at this point, once he has like this sheet with the hole in it, just exposing my balls, and I'm lying on my back, he takes out this giant needle, right? Like the giant needle to inject the local anesthetic. And this is the part I was honestly most scared about going into it. I thought for sure he was just going to inject this thing directly into my balls. But what he actually did was he kind of like pinched up the skin near the top of my balls and just injected it, uh, the anesthesia, he just injected it in there. You know, and it hurt a little, but honestly, not not too bad at all. And then I'm just instantly numb, like my entire sack. Like I just can't feel a thing. It's pretty incredible, actually. Like shout out to to Modern Medicine. So then he starts going to work, right? So it's numb. He tests, it's numb. Yeah, it's numb. He starts going to work. And then like 10 seconds in, once he's working, the dude's like, oh, so did, did you see the Oscars last night? How about that? How about that Chris Rock, Will Smith thing? And I'm like, man, you know, I get that this dude's been doing this for 20 years. I, you know, I get that he does two to four dicks a day. You know, I, I get it. But man, you know, I'd really appreciate some fucking focus here, you know? And then a few minutes later, he says, uh, uh, you know, most people do these on Fridays, he says, because you really shouldn't go to work for at least 48 hours, you know, probably more like four days. You should really just be off your feet. He's like, you're not going to work, are you? And I say, no, you know, I actually work from home, so I'm good. And of course, you know, once I tell people that, of course, uh, I knew what was coming next. He says, oh, what do you do? And, and as always, I just never know what to say in these spots. You know, I, I of course, could have gone with the tried and true, oh, doc, you know, I'm in predictive analytics, you know. But I, I said something, you know, like, I, I don't know what I said. I, I said something like I have a site that, that revolves around fantasy sports or something. Turns out, of course, the dude is a big Broncos fan. We talk about that for a while. We talk about Russ Wilson, about Aaron Rodgers. I mean, all the while, the dude is in my balls, you know. I, I mean, I actually like the guy, uh, the doctor. He seems cool, you know. I, I'm happy to chat with him. I, I guess I just, I wasn't thinking that I'd be talking about Devontae Adams' contract with my dick exposed and getting cut up, you know? Anyway, the whole procedure, you know, only takes about 15 minutes, you know, seven and a half minutes per testy. And then uh, after it's over, he asked me to squeeze my sack together uh, with like this gauze pad to stop the bleeding for five minutes. No problem. I do it. But then like five minutes later, the nurse comes in. I thought he was going to come back and check. Nurse comes back in to check, you know, which is just so humiliating. I mean, she takes the sheet off. You know, my cock is so shriveled, it, it, you know. She checks the wound though. It's good. Gives it the thumbs up and I just walk out. Honestly, like the whole thing was not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. Uh, I'm still a little torn on whether it was the right call. Like seriously though, I, I generally think voluntary surgery is like a really bad idea. 
our bodies are so evolved, so fine-tuned to do everything themselves. You know, I, I, I can't help but think that fucking with one part of your body voluntarily can lead to other complications. But, you know, the vasectomy has been around for so, so long. It's so, so common. Seems like it's pretty safe. So uh, I think, you know, as long as my dick returns to 100% functionality after this within a reasonable time frame, like, I think I'll be happy I did it. Oh, oh, uh, I almost forgot the best part. So so after it's over, the nurse comes in to go over the uh, post-procedure instructions, you know, the usual stuff, you know, put ice on it, no exercise for a week. And then she's like, by the way, you have to ejaculate 30 times in the next two to three months before you can get your sperm tested to make sure the surgery worked. And so, you know, of course, I'm thinking 30 times in, in two to three months. I mean, come on, honey, that's that's amateur hour. Let's get real. Um, but anyways, I, you know, I, I appreciate all the support on this. You know, it was a, a fun saga for sure. Thanks for all the notes that people sent. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it. All right. Now I have to get to some real, actual, important news that I actually am legit excited about. I know I've hinted at it multiple times over the last year on this podcast, but it is now official. We are officially launching our third sport at EstablishTheRun.com, and it is indeed golf. I, I've talked so much about why I think DFS golf is great. You know, most importantly, it's a weekly game, just like NFL is a weekly game. It's not a daily game like basketball and baseball. Um, I think golf is a game theory game to some degree because the range of outcomes is so wide, just like in the NFL. And I think it's actually great to sweat. I know people have differing opinions on what it's like to watch golf. I actually think it's really fun to sweat golf. But as I've always said, you know, we would never, ever launch a product if we didn't think we could actually help people win. Like, obviously, we'd make more money if we had products for NFL, NBA, uh, MLB, NHL, golf, MMA, F1, tennis, esports, fucking badminton, or, or whatever else, you know, DraftKings and FanDuel offer. Obviously, if we had packages or products for all those, we'd make more money. But I think people underestimate how hard it is to actually provide value in a sport, like actual alpha, as the kids would say. So that's where the people slash data we have for this golf product comes in. I can't say the names yet, uh, but we are hoping to reveal on Friday. Um, the golf product we're launching on Friday, and it will be ready for next week's Masters. It'll be built around this unique data and projections that we have. We'll have base projections. We'll have 90th percentile projections, aka ceiling for each golfer. We'll have each golfer's odds to make the cut, what we make it. And to me, actually, that last one is so valuable. I mean, so much of DFS golf is getting six of six through the cut. And we're also working on our algorithm for golf ownership projections. And again, I think that's so, so, so massive. And I think just like football, we'll have the best ones. And then we'll add more content and tools to golf as we get settled in here, just like we continue to build on NFL. But I think what I described above is a really great start. And as someone who's been playing DFS golf off and on for the last, I don't know, couple of years. It's just such a great game. And I really think that it's just going to continue to get more and more popular. Like you don't have to follow um, injuries and a lot of correlation stuff. And it's just easier for people to follow and to handle. And I think that'll create a lot of popularity. It's just fun. So head to the site on Friday. We should have the golf subscribe page up then. Check it out. Turn in, tune into the Masters show next week, which we'll be announcing who will be on it on Friday as well. And yeah, excited about it. All right, enough is enough. Let's get to everyone's favorite portion of the program, listener questions. Producer Luke, hit the theme music. All right, cleaning out the question bin here. Some leftovers from the last couple of weeks. Question one comes from Nelly Biz. He says, have you gotten into any NFL all day action yet? The streets are calling. So Nelly is referring to that Dapper Labs uh, latest product, essentially NBA Top Shot, but for NFL. Um, they're calling it NFL all day. I'm sure many of you who are listening to this bought or at least were aware of NBA Top Shot. You know, Top Shot had that insane, insane, insane run during lockdown. Anyway, I, I haven't messed with uh, NFL all day at all. Um, I just think you have to really be interested in collecting cards and stuff, you know, like really deep into it. And I'm just not. By the way, we do have Gary Hartman and Cody Main 
who are very into collectibles and collecting and they're on NFL all day. If you're interested in diving deeper into collect collecting from two really sharp guys, establish the collection is the podcast for you. But anyways, like I'm just not that into it. And that's the thing about Top Shot though. Like I actually did think and do think it's a great idea. Like it's so much better than actual cards with the grading and having to store them and physically buy them and sell them. I think the whole concept of digital cards is really sharp, but the pricing on Top Shot was just, so absurd like when tyler hero cards are selling for 30k you know the market's fucked up right actually the whole thing is so tilting like everyone probably remembers the bales article that set the whole thing off you know uh I, whatever he called it i spent 35k on a youtube highlight of john Morant. here's why and i had a small piece of that card you know which seemed great and was great for a while we never sold it but I, i'm not even sure we're up on it now because the platform pricing is so buried. You know, the market is so buried. I mean, you know, we nailed it. John Morant is insanely fucking good. That's his best card. That's his rookie card. And I think we're still losing because Top Shop prices are just such dust. I'd love a cleaner way to bet high stakes on players, you know, but it's just not that clean with cards. And that's the way I feel about NFL all day. You know, yeah, I think Terry McLaurin is probably better than the market does. But... I could be right and still lose because of other market dynamics than McLaurin's success. But yeah, I mean, still generally speaking, I think it's a cool idea. I'm just not that into collectibles. Uh, Question two from First Round Kicker. He says, I saw a polarizing post on Reddit about people letting their ass-eating dogs lick their plates clean before putting them in the dishwasher. I'd say most people thought it was disgusting, but a surprising number let the beast lick the plates. Curious to hear your take on the matter. It's crazy because I really do hate fecal matter, but there's something about this fucking dog, man. Like, I just love Jerry so much. It's like, it's like painful to me how much I love her. So not only do I let her lick the dishes, but I actually let her lick my face, you know, and I shouldn't even say let, I mean, I love it. Like I make her lick my face. And sometimes I even go tongue to tongue with her as well, which is really wild because I know, believe me, I know that she licks her own asshole. I mean, I know she does. I watch her do it. But there's just something about dogs, man. I, I just I just love them. I cannot wait to retire and open Levitan's doggy daycare business, the most loving location for your dog to spend their afternoons. I mean, it's going to be great. Question three from Eric says, is the NFL draft such a crapshoot that teams should just save money by using Kuiper's big board and others instead of scouting? Going off the consensus board really works out, i.e., the Eagles would have DK Metcalf and Justin Jefferson rather than J.J. Orsega Whiteside and Jalen Rager. I think people just overestimate, wildly overestimate what a good hit rate is when you're picking players in the NFL draft or in the NBA draft. I mean, in reality, it's just so, so low for so many different reasons. But the bottom line is it's just hard to know how good a 21-year-old kid will be in X scheme, you know, a new scheme against different players. You know, it's just hard. And that's why it's so obvious to me, at least, that the strategy in NFL and NBA drafts isn't pick the right players. You know, that's a fool's errand. The, the right strategy to me is to do what Sam Hinkie did, acquire as many darts at the board, at the top of the board, as you can, and then hope to hit on some. So, you know, I'd always be trading. You know, and if I needed players I was rebuilding, I'd always be trading back. Unless I had like, you know, a top three pick. Or unless I needed a quarterback. I'd just always be trading. If I was picking, you know, 10, 12, 15, even like eight. I mean, if there wasn't a quarterback there I really wanted and I was rebuilding, I'd really, really, really try to be trading back. And the fans would hate me, of course. I'd never take a player. I'd just be trading back, trading back, trading back. But, but anyway, I, I think structural drafting and having a macro strategy is well worth it for NFL teams. Like, I'm sure they're over-scouting when it comes to evaluating some dudes like hip swivel and stupid shit like that, but they need a scouting team to like come up with a strategy and a plan and have some baseline on players. Question four from Ben. He says, what are your tips for fighting seasonal affective disorder? Besides winning over 250K in a DFS tourney, the winter time definitely affects my mood as I get older. Yeah, I know what Ben's saying. I have no tips. I mean, I think seasonal mood disorders are real. Like I moved across the country in part because of it. I mean, I I really think society massively underestimates the effect that weather has on happiness. Massively. I mean, the weather in Philadelphia was so, so bad. I mean, the summer is unbearably hot and humid. Everyone's bitching. The winter is like bone chilling, cold and dark 
you know, never sunny. Everyone's bitching. There's barely a fall or a spring. You know, I think we as a people are, are, are meant to be outside. And, you know, since we got to Denver, I mean, Denver really has truly incredible weather. I mean, the sun is out literally almost every day. It, it's almost never super cold, you know. It just makes people want to be outside and be in better moods. Now, is it as good in Denver as Hawaii or San Diego? No, you know, of course not. It's better. And I think if you went from Philadelphia to Denver, you would notice a change in mood in people. And I think if you went from Denver to Hawaii or San Diego, you'd notice a different mood in people. But yeah, I mean, I don't have any tips, man. I think you just got to go where where your mood is good. And I think the weather plays a big part of that. Question five from Jeff. He says, what is the worst part of off-season fantasy football Twitter? And why is it everything? Yeah, I don't want to say that I'm tuned out to off-season fantasy football Twitter because I'm not. Um, but I do think that people can lose sight of what actually matters when it's the off-season. Like we know the biggest thing in fantasy but football by far is opportunity. What, and what kind of opportunity players get. But in the offseason, people start coming with more talent takes and nonsense coach speak takes. And, you know, I get it. You know, there's, there's no games. It's, it's what we have. But I also get why people hate offseason fantasy football Twitter. I, I do think that one thing that helps is best ball, right? Like before best ball got popular, there was basically no accountability, you know, nothing actionable at all through the whole offseason. But now that we're drafting constantly, you know, all spring, all summer, it, it does matter. Like you need to have your takes on point if you're going to be putting up real money that you're going to tie up for seven months or whatever, like you got to be on it. So I think the news and the takes do matter. Question six from Ned says, when will you know it's time to hang up the basketball shoes? Such a tough sport on the body. I recently had back surgery and I'm not sure I'm willing to risk getting injured again. I'm 36 years old. Yeah, damn, Ned. I'm sorry to hear it, man. 36 years old with back surgery. I think that's a pretty good sign to hang it up, man. Like nothing is worth your health. I, I know it's corny. But there's just no point to having anything, money, anything without your health. You just can't take it for granted. So, but with basketball though, like right now I just suck. Like I'm old and I suck, right? I don't think I'm out there getting hurt though. Like I just suck and that's fine. I, I can play back to back, no problem. I can play for a couple hours. I'm good. I, I think if I play and then I can't move for a couple days, well, then it's time for pickleball or, or mahjong or golf or whatever it is old people do. Uh, side note, I was actually in, in Key West last week for my buddy's 40th birthday party. Uh, we played pickleball one day. It was my first time ever playing pickleball. Uh, I, I get why the olds like it. You know, you don't have to move too much. It's it's fun. It's like some mix of ping pong and, and tennis. I dig it. Um, so yeah, I'd play. I mean, literally all I want to do is play sports and, and bet on myself and them though. So, you know, I'll play anything. But yeah, I could see myself playing pickleball once I can't play tennis anymore, of course. All right, question seven. Last question we're going to do today comes from D'Lo. Says, have you ever discussed Jack Shacks on the pod? Well, D'Lo, I, I had never actually heard the term Jack Shacks before. And when I don't know what something means, I always go to the most respected dictionary on earth, one of my favorite websites ever, UrbanDictionary.com. And here is what the fine folks at UrbanDictionary.com have for Jack Shacks. It says, a Jack Shack is a place like a CD massage parlor or modeling studio, or gentleman spa, where you can get a hand job for a reasonable price and little fear of getting arrested for soliciting. And then, of course, they use it in a sentence, hey, buddy, gotten your rocks off at the Jack Shack lately? Yeah, you know, I don't really have a take here other than uh, I think prostitution should be legal and these, you know, Jack Shacks, um, you know, go by the wayside. You know, like what's going on now uh, in the streets with prostitution and jack shacks, wherever else. I mean, to me, that's way, way, way more dangerous for the people in the game. You know, I, I think get it legal, get it regulated, have consumer and worker protections. You know, it seems like a no brainer to me. It's just, it's easier to catch shady shit. I mean, if Calvin Ridley was betting sports with a bookie on the street in Florida, like it's unlikely he gets caught or at least not that quickly, but he's betting on a legal app. In Florida, well, yeah, they snap catch him. I mean, they catch him immediately, obviously. And it's same with the sex, you know. Uh, these girls that are, you know, getting uh, handled by pimps, you know, they're assaulted by dudes, like horrible, horrible stuff. Make it legal. Bring it all into the light. Let it be seen, no? I don't know. It's my two cents. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of the Solo Pod. Appreciate you all being here. We'll be back later this week for a very special mystery guest, golf podcast check that out 
be sure to head to the site on Friday to see exactly what we have planned for golf. For producer Luke, for Jerry, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.